Welcome back to part two of my interview with Thomas van Breda. In this part, we'll discuss in depth Thomas's own interesting findings regarding an important concept and stage of development in Crowley's system called the abyss. We also talk about the various misunderstandings about Crowley, how Crowley has influenced popular culture, and also why Thomas finds Crowley so appealing. Enjoy! Well, uh, we've had a Quite an interesting discussion that I could say this is our foundation yeah. of uh, of the history. So let's uh, let's move on from from that, and let's move on to your research and your mm-hmm. own conclusions about Crowley. Uh, the first thing that I should ask is how your research differs from your predecessors and your contemporaries, if you can. If you can talk about that, if that's if that's something that you can answer, I don't know. If... Um, yes, I can. Okay. I just um, <laughs> let me think of how to start. Okay. Um, I think that the right place to start is to sketch what I discover to be the main storyline, so to speak, scholars have about Crowley. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every scholarly article, passage, you know, dictionary entry, whatnot. Um, it always sort of amounts to the same story that is told about Crowley. He was a member of the Golden Dawn. Well, you know, usually it starts with he studied at Cambridge because that is that is a unique factor. Then the Golden Dawn. Then he had this big revelation in 1904. And then his entire life changed because he believed he became the prophet of a new aeon of Thelema, this new religion. And that's usually where it ends. Right. So there is this basic storyline that that I accepted for many years as well that, okay, so, you know, the the big part of Crowley's life is completely devoted to not playing the role, but being the role of this religious prophet and that this 1904 revelation was the most important event of his life and that that's simply what happened. And usually in scholarly studies, this is combined with this conclusion that in the beginning years, Crowley was more interested in the ideals of the golden dawn. So union with God, um, sort of this mystical, magical journey of self-transformation, self-discovery. And that as soon as Thelema sort of started taking over, it was more about um, a more, I want to say stereotypical magic, but more ceremonial, magical rituals for other purposes not necessarily always directed towards this mystical union that he sort of drifted away from mysticism a little bit. And um, I think the main reason is because Crowley started to become a lot more interested in, in tantric magic, in sexual magic, you know, using the body as an extension or a replacement of a magical temple. And I think his ideas about the will are often interpreted as oh, okay, so now it's no longer about this big mystical union. Now it's more about, I want this, and now I, I use my will to to make this magical effect happen. And it's more in line with more general interpretations of magic as sort of manipulations of reality for a certain goal. Mm. And I think a big part of that conclusion is the way Crowley presents the true will sometimes. There's this very often quoted passage where he writes that anything can be an act of magical will. So if I say I want to have coffee and I use all of my magical energies to make this happen, then it is an act of magic. Then it is an act of true will because all true magic is an act of true will. And I think that has sort of created this understanding that, oh, okay, so suddenly Crowley just does whatever. And he thinks he's the prophet of a new age, true will, and no one really knows to, you know, what this true will is supposed to do for Crowley's own life. But, you know, he uses a lot of drugs. He has a lot of sex. <laughs> and I think it creates this kind of degenerative storyline where Crowley sort of lost his mystical intention and, um, yeah, just started to become a magician who 
fell prey to his own delusions about being this next level global prophet. And in some scholars, this really seems to take on a a judgment um, form where they almost write, you know, he just went insane. Mm. And that always struck me because Crowley continues to write some really amazing texts and really insightful, really clever, really intellectual works where I do not see that um, move away from mysticism. For me, there is a lot more continuity. Um, you know, for, I always refer to Magic Without Tears, which is a compilation of letters he wrote to his students. And in my opinion, that same spirit of longing for a mystical union and emphasizing this importance of, of, um, of that mystical ascent is still completely intact. So I've always been fascinated by what exactly has that event of 1904 changed? Because for me, in his worldview, I don't see that many changes. Mm. And that has led me to explore a little subject called the abyss, which is an extremely complicated um, but fascinating area of interest for Crowley. Um, I haven't really found it conceptualized like that anywhere else. So it's, it's kind of an original concept. And um, he basically insists that this crossing of the abyss, which um, did not take place in 1904, but, you know, years afterwards was in fact the highlight of his life. If you look at it from a, um, psychological perspective you know he claims that this experience really changed everything about how he how he thought about the world how he saw the world how he saw himself in it and in fact in the same autobiography he both mentions 1904 and the crossing of the abyss as the most important periods in his life so in two different passages Mm -hmm. so there seems to be one narrative where he confirms, yes, I became this prophet of the new aeon and this, you know, started a whole new career path for me, so to speak. But then there is also this secondary narrative where he is still the same old soul searching for a mystical salvation Mm. and has all of the appropriate solitary individual experiences that lead toward that attainment. And it's like these narratives don't really mix. And I've been focusing on this second Second narrative. narrative. Okay, so where does Crowley's mystical journey continue Mm. after 1904? Um, And it's different from other scholarship because I find that scholars usually stop their interest in that aspect of of Crowley's life after he starts to take Thelema seriously. And I understand because there's a lot of interesting um, angles you 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 can approach Crowley from. But yeah, this is just an angle that hasn't really been explored. Okay. And, if I can stop yeah, you just for just for a second, for people who are listening who have no idea what the abyss is about, what it is, <laughs> sure. as far as the concept is concerned, uh, if we can just stand still with this for just a moment, the abyss mm-hmm. is the concept of it's like the the last major hurdle, if I understand Mm -hmm. it correctly, yes, the last major hurdle that you have to undertake before you can actually realize your true will. Am I, is that succinct enough (laughs) to state what the abyss is about? Well, this is what Crowley says, but interestingly, I think you're saying that because you've been spending so much time with me (laughs) because this is not a general consensus. Um, For a lot of scholars I've talked to, this isn't the case. Oh. Um, it is always more focused on the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. So I will have to get into okay. that a little bit. This was the big goal of the Golden Dawn. So this was right. the metaphor they used to explain what their big mission was. You know, This was supposed to be the big salvation moment for everyone. This uniting with yeah, a part of yourself, which is at the same time not a part of yourself, mm-hmm. bigger than yourself. Um, so we're talking about the Holy Guardian Angel, Guardian Angel right now, not the Abyss. Yes. Okay. Yes, correct. Um, 
that was always the big goal in the Golden Dawn. And mm -hmm. Crowley continues to believe that this is absolutely a magnum opus, so to speak, for every magical student. But he sometimes, not always, but in his final works, it becomes more, um, um, more prevalent. He sometimes also speaks of two necessary crises. And he uses that word, which I think is really interesting. Yes, you have the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. So this is kind of a mystical union that um, creates a permanent change in one's consciousness. It's always described as a permanent enhancement of consciousness. But that this is necessarily followed by a second big step, which, like you said, is kind of the final hurdle. And this is the crossing of the abyss um, which sort of puts a seal on the whole operation. Crowley doesn't believe, like you said, that you can discover your true will if you haven't taken that second step. And this is what I believe, mm -hmm. and I hope that I have shown in my bachelor's thesis and my research master's thesis that this is not something I'm assuming, that this is explicit in Crowley's writings. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, this crossing of the abyss has everything to do with the destruction of individuality, personality, reason. It's like the entire person has to be completely erased in a catastrophic form, because every time Crowley talks about the abyss, it's always tinged with a sense of horror, of fear, of, of complete shock, of completely being overwhelmed by by these mythical forces that you simply cannot survive. It is a mystical death. And he um, talks very poetically, but also very frighteningly sometimes. And I might quote him if I have the time later. But the thing that I found so interesting is that even though this happens around 1906, well, really between 1906 and 1909, those are kind of the, this is the period in his life where this is occurring, this crossing of the abyss. So this is a, a process that occurs over multiple years. It is kind of a conclusion of philosophical thoughts he already entertained around the, uh, you know, around 1900. So um, he always was interested in ego death, in mystical absorption. He always seemed convinced from the beginning that the only logical end of spirituality is in a complete destruction of the self. Even though this wasn't really much of a theme in magical literature around that time, it, it, it was never really so explicit. Usually, um, in the language of the Golden Dawn, it's, it's more... I mean, I'm not going to say it's a it's a pleasant experience because the knowledge of conversation is usually also described in, you know, with language, you know, connecting it to the crucifixion and the aspirant has to die on the cross of the higher self. But for Crowley, the abyss is a much more destructive experience where the, the self is completely wiped out. So what I think I have done is... Um, discovered a consistent theme, which has existed from the beginning of Crowley's interest in magic, has led him to develop these original insights, original techniques, original experiences, which weren't really offered anywhere else, after which he presented those same techniques for other people. So now you suddenly have Crowley saying, well, I destroyed my ego, so now everyone else has to do so too. So his experience became a necessary step for every magician's career. And this is a very new suggestion that is still influential, not everywhere, but this concept is still around. Um, and yeah, no one's really talking about it. So I'm really the, and I'm not even publishing, but I'm kind of the <laughs> only researcher who is taking it as a particular subject, whereas other scholars are treating it kind of as a, as you know, one other event of his magical life but when I read Crowley saying that this is the most important magical result he has ever achieved, I need to pay more attention to that. Mm. And I think in my research, I've shown that it has changed Crowley to such an immense degree 
that it has to be a prime concern for other scholars as well. So I'm trying to piece it all together now and figure out how it impacted Crowley, um, where that shows. But what is absolutely um, decisive for me is that Crowley, to the end of his life, insisted that this was the most important magical result that he achieved and that other people could achieve. This was truly a absolutely necessary step for his religion to succeed. And it's kind of a missing puzzle piece Mm. that I'm exploring in my research. Okay. So you're, this is fascinating. Um, (laughs) The, the ego has to be killed then in this uh, crossing of the abyss and that, of course, is a psychological term. And yes. did, I guess, my preliminary question question is, was Crowley uh, influenced a lot by psych- psychology and, and that type of terminology? Or, or yes. was he yeah. was? Okay. So in Not, that, if, yeah. that, if that's the case, can we see then this first step that he talked about uh, about contacting the or making this uh, union with the holy guardian angel, could that be considered like the higher self, the true self? Oh, that's that's one of the questions everyone's asking, okay. um, including in the magical community, which is interesting. From what I can piece together from Crowley's writings the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel is where you start to make contact with this higher force Mm -hmm. that sort of permanently starts to reside within you. So it's, but it is only, it's not just you. It's something. Oh, like greater than you. Is that, that's where I'm getting at. Is it just you, but your, your most perfect emanation of yourself. So your Mm -hmm. highest self that is used kind of symbolically in terms of like an angel, like this Mm -hmm. perfected being Mm -hmm. that, that you are in union with this perfect being. And then Mm -hmm. the, the next step then would be getting rid of the ego because that's like a false identity. Then that's this, this mask that's uh, that you put up in front of, of yourself that you show everyone, but that's not really who you are. So that you need this second step to be able to get rid of that false Mm -hmm. sense of myself, my, my identity, because you already have this union with your most perfected self. Is that how we're supposed to understand this in your opinion? My personal opinion is that Crowley offers m- multiple answers to oh, that question. Of course. <laughs> of course, yes. Um, sometimes he has written that the Holy Guardian Angel is a separate being, mm. completely unrelated to what you just described as y- your perfected self, that it is some you know, discarnate being who simply whose job, whose cosmic job is to guide you. Mm. At other times, even sometimes within the same work, he says, no, this is um, basically a state of mind you reach when you just perform certain techniques. So again, typically you have the very cold, um, scientific-esque explanation, and you have a very mythical explanation. Um, one of the more explicit passages about exactly what you're talking about is in Magic, I believe, which is one of his most famous works, where he writes that this knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, um, the, the big goal of the Golden Dawn, is in fact, just like you described, um, even though it may appear at when you experience it as a union with this being that is just bigger and more complete and more fulfilling and and everything more than you, it is really a form of, I don't want to say egomania, but it is tainted. This is something that Crowley emphasizes in many works. This experience is amazing and absolutely life-changing, but it's not perfect. 
you know, this this insistence of the reason of your rational mind to try to control everything, it's still blocking you from experiencing that same experience on a higher form. So that has to go. And from what I can understand, Crowley believes that as soon as you succeed at attaining this knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, your ego just launches a counterattack that is so violent and so aggressive that ultimately it just ends up destroying itself. And that seems wow. to be what Crowley describes as the crossing of the abyss. Basically, your mind just getting fired up to such an intensity that it just implodes, reveals its fundamental emptiness. And that only then afterwards you can appreciate the Holy Guardian Angel, whatever that then is, to its most complete degree. But of course, he, and this is the whole problem, once you have crossed the abyss, according to Crowley, you have reached such a transcendent point of being above reason, being above duality, being above language, that you could never communicate this nature of reality to anyone else. And this is a common feature of you know spiritual writings um but the interesting thing for me is that crowley only really talks about that in relationship to this abyss yeah spiritual experiences are always hard to describe but when you have crossed the abyss you permanently choose to operate on a higher arc so he always refused to describe anything about what happens afterwards and Every time someone asks him, for example, in a letter, like, okay, so what does this mean? What, what happens afterwards? He always says, there is absolutely no way that I can, there is no language I can use to explain mm. what happens. Um, because in these realms, or, you know, that already is a very suggestive term, but in, in this state of mind, I should say, mm -hmm. um, there is absolutely no reference point to anything that you and I could understand operating from a regular untrained mm. human mind but so he, that makes researching it very difficult right <laughs> and in these later communications he refers to himself in the third person as if he's talking about this mm. guy named alistair crowley that you know that lives wherever yes. he was living at the time and he has children and Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I have the quote here. Sure, read it. I think it's it's yeah. it's a absolutely brilliant um, quotation because it he somehow did manage to put it into words in a way that is quite easy to understand. So I'll just read it. This is okay. from um, this is from his autobiography, Confessions, and he's talking here about his experience in 1905. So this is the start. This oh. isn't even the big climax, okay. but it's basically the same experience, but a little bit more simplified. And he writes, I quote, the effect of my ordeal had been to remove all forces soever, which had impinged on my normal direction. My star had been diverted from its proper orbit by, had been held back by the attraction of other heavenly bodies. Their influence had been removed. So this is all a little bit vague, but mm -hmm. now comes the part where it becomes a little bit more clear. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I was really free. I had no personality left. To take a concrete case, I found myself in the middle of China with a wife and child. I was no longer influenced by love for them, no longer interested in protecting them as I had been, but there was a man, Alistair Crowley, husband and father of a certain case, of certain experience, of travel in remote parts of the world, and it was his business to give them his undivided love, care, and protection. He could do this very much more efficiently than before when I was aware of what he was doing. End quote. So that last sentence is, I think, really interesting. That when interesting. I was aware of what he was doing. So clearly we're dealing with a set of experiences that completely upset what we would call a normal sense of mm -hmm. subjectivity. Mm -hmm. You know, I am my body, I am my mind. Mm -hmm. In these experiences, Crowley clearly upset this regular state of functioning because, you know, what it, you know, from further quotations, you know, which you can all read in my thesis, he really seems adamant that 
a part of his consciousness was freed from his body and mind. And he keeps alluding to this idea that his body and mind were sort of functioning on autopilot, that they were just operating in the world as usual, but that he was elsewhere. And that I find extremely that interesting. Amazing. But he, he was operating, but he says in, in, in his writing that, it wasn't as if he was an empty shell. He was, he was providing love and protection and care and, uh, and all of these good qualities, I guess you could say for, for, uh, what, what we would consider good qualities in a human being that he was yes. doing all of that for his wife and his child. So it wasn't as if he was some kind of zombie. No, that, but also interesting that he says now at least this this other uh personality entity who however this other consciousness part of his consciousness says now i'm not meddling in all of that anymore and i was making it yeah. more difficult for him when i was meddling in it right and that actually that is, reminds me a lot of that's, mysticism yeah because yeah. i have heard that before i when i first read that i immediately thought of um, St. John of the Cross, who is a Catholic mystic, for Christ's mm. sake, who has a for very Christ's similar <laughs> <laughs> description of enlightenment. He also writes of a certain automatism that emerges. If you reach a certain spiritual level, you don't have to consciously live in your body anymore. Um, mm. But it goes along fine. Just like you said, you don't turn into a vegetable. Mm -hmm. You just don't have to do it consciously anymore and it's so much easier and he has that same sentiment it also uh, it reminds me of buddhist authors who describe of a certain spontaneity a certain elasticity in reacting to circumstances reacting to situations you don't always have to think so much and you just sort of you operate the right way it's like everything is in harmony and you don't have to you know, be so self-aware all the time. Mm. And Crowley um, explicitly mentions that even though his life, uh, I have another quote here, um, my ordinary career becomes a welter of strange adventures, yet the spiritual life is all important and absolutely simple. So there clearly is this separation that occurs mm. here. And, and it sounds like he's also talking about different uh, layers of like time or something or space. I don't know what he's oh, talking yes, about. I don't know how he's referring to this actually, because is he speaking of like his, like a, like there's layers and that he's on one layer and then the other Crowley is on the other layer kind of that, but they're like oh, going through life yeah. together, like in, a, in, in like parallel dimensions or something like that, or other people have suggested that. Um, uh, Israel Regardi, one of his own mm -hmm. students, is is worthy of a mention there. He has proposed this idea that um, this also explains why Crowley talks in different languages and writes in certain voices, so to speak, because he seems to be operating on different states of consciousness at the same time and can choose which one to move in, so to speak. Crowley doesn't offer any hints towards that himself. Right. When Crowley uses layer symbolism, it's always, um, he has this onion uh, mm. metaphor, which, and it, all of these symbols always point out to, you know, you peel it right until the end. And, and at the end, there is just emptiness. There is nothing. And this is such a, a massively important philosophical consideration that is constant in his life that, ultimate reality is non-dualistic it 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 is always beyond what is dual and um so i don't think hurley would like that idea like oh i'm operating at different layers i think he would find that a distraction for his mm. students like no you just focus your direction on attaining to that non-duality that nothingness that is at the same time everything because it makes absolutely no sense in that state of mind to differentiate between anything. He has this amazing quote where he uses, and Crowley rarely describes his spiritual experiences, but he has this one quote that I can't quite find right now. 
but he basically says when you're in that um, non-dualist superior state and you look at an apple and a pear, you can absolutely, with absolute certainty, say that there is absolutely no difference between those two things. They are absolutely one. Everything is one. But there is an awareness somehow that a difference is being made for its own convenience. That's one of the passages I've always remembered. So even though Crowley acknowledges that ultimately everything is all in the same, he is still aware that differences can be made and should be made because otherwise, you know, human brains simply operate right. dualistically. But as long as you believe that the differences are real, that's when you're spiritually asleep. You're supposed to understand mm. at all times that there really is no difference between anything and any other thing. And then you're free. And then you can react naturally and according to your own nature mm -hmm. because you're no longer insisting that certain things are more real than others or that I am different from you or that I am somehow separate in this cosmos. Then it becomes a big game, so to speak, and you can choose which conceptions you're going to use for your own life. That's right. kind of, that's, that's the easiest he makes it for us, that language. Okay. Um, that is the farthest he goes in, in, in explaining it in everyday language. Well, what you just described there is so different from the conceptions that most people have about him. Because yes, everyone, absolutely. I mean... The, I mean, there's so many misunderstandings about Crowley. I guess let's, okay, let's be uh, logical about all of this. We're going to move into misconceptions about Crowley <laughs> right oh, <good>. now. <laughs> so um, we were talking just before about still in within the, the realm of academia. So let's, let's start with academic misunderstandings. What do yeah. you think is the major misunderstanding about Crowley within academia? I think there are two that are interlinked. Okay. I think um, this Crowley starts his magical career for a very specific reason. And it is because he had a, you know, what, what I can only describe as an, ex, as an existential crisis. Um, mm -hmm. And this happens in his last year of Cambridge. Um, so this is 1898, the, the same year he eventually joined the Golden Dawn, interestingly. And, but yeah, before he joined that order. And um, he describes a state of complete agony because he somehow realized that all human ambition is uh, is... Um, meaningless that that's that those are the words he he uses and he sort of has this this just a purely intellectual meditation so there's nothing fancy there's no magical ritual he's not really doing anything special but somehow he experienced this experiences this incredibly overpowering saddening realization that whatever he is planning to do with his career with his personal life um that everything will be canceled out at death that nothing he will be able to do will survive that because even if and you know, he has this this longer passage but it basically comes down to this sentence even if i change the whole world then one day the planet will you know be destroyed or or you know won't be people won't live there anymore and no one will remember me so even if i do this most insane thing people will never acknowledge my infinity because I am mortal. And that for him made everything suddenly completely meaningless. And at the end of his life, at around the end of his life in Magic Without Tears, he completely repeats the same sentiment. And he explains to one of his students, you know, I can promise you so much with magic i can promise you that, that you know that you can do anything your heart desires and that you will that you will have power over other people or that you will attain to the heights of spirituality but 
in reality, the only reason I became a magician is because I lost all meaning in my life. And that has always struck me because it reveals a very desperate Crowley in search of answers, in search for a solution to an essentially philosophical problem. You know, how do I live my life meaningfully? How can I give meaning to a life that I cannot I, I cannot make meaningful anymore. Mm. And interestingly, and this is the part that I've always remembered, he describes this in his autobiography as an intellectual realization. Okay, so life is meaningless. Like I've said that at a bar, you know, like, oh my God, life right. is completely meaningless. Everyone can think that. But he says the this realization came with such a powerful almost trance-like force that it became as certain to me and as permanently certain to me as saying the sky is blue. So Mm. he did consider it to be a trance state, even though nothing special happened. You know, he didn't, you know, have a vision or anything. It was all in his mind. And it, it created this intellectual conflict within him that basically just started rotting for years until eventually he destroyed his own mind. And for him, that was the only solution. And and this is a theory that you find scattered across his works that the reason for his unhappiness and so also for the unhappiness of everyone else, because again, Crowley believes that his own experiences are relevant for everyone, is because people cling to this stability of individuality of personality of the ego it's only because crowley tried to survive somehow that he made himself unhappy by separating himself from the universe from everything around him from insisting this lie this hallucination of his rational mind that he was a person and for crowley the only solution was to tear that hallucination out root and stem so that one returns to a more childlike state of simple union with everything and everyone. And I think that is what keeps him going. And that's kind of a factor I think scholars have been missing, um, explaining his ambition. You know, why does he give up everything to practice magic? Why does he still insist when he's, you know, addicted to drugs and poor? I mean, he didn't die like a glorious magician who was wealthy and had servants. I mean, okay, maybe he did, but um, he died almost as a failure. Many occultist colleagues have described him as, you know, he completely lost it. Mm-hmm. He failed his objective. But on his deathbed, so to speak, he is still saying to his students, no, I achieved what I wanted. I achieved everything that I wanted. I found the solution. And the solution is to make non-duality manifest within oneself. And I have achieved it. Even though his life was in complete ruin, he still is completely sure that he has achieved it, even though there is absolutely no proof. It's simply a shift in one's perspective. Right that saved his life. And that whole aspect of himself has never really been appreciated or even mentioned in other scholarly writings, which focus so much and so understandably on Crowley's triumphant tone of, I am a prophet and I'm here to proclaim this message. And he makes a lot of bold claims like no other shall say nay. And when you do your true will, you will have the whole power of the universe. And it's this completely overblown orgiastic tone of excess and pleasure. But then in other passages, he seems still completely unhappy, still completely sure that as beautiful as that promise is, unless one completely destroys oneself, which is a devastating experience, one can never know true happiness. So it's there's this massive difference in tone when he is speaking to the masses, so to speak, mm. and when he is speaking to his students who he knows are suffering because he has known suffering and he knows that any solution isn't going to be magical power because he tried magic. And after we left the golden dawn, he was the first to say, 
I'm still not satisfied. This is what I mentioned earlier in the interview. Mm -hmm. Um, Magic worked, but it wasn't the solution. He had to remain a mystic to complete his magical journey. And he never retracted that position. And that level of constant appreciation of mysticism I think is completely lost on most of the scholars studying Crowley who insist that he became a a magician to core, you know, um, performing these magical rituals um, with drugs and with sex, which he did absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But his direction to me is seems completely constant. And that is always to, as he says, to um, reduce duality to the zero it's always that same conviction that non-duality is that is the goal whether you're a magician a a mystic religious person a scientist that is where everything is revealed and that makes the crossing of the abyss so important so i think the misunderstanding here is that a large chunk of his writing is considered less important um, because it doesn't fit this narrative of, and then Crowley believed he was this big prophet who was going to change the world, because they don't match. And I think that might be annoying for scholars, because yeah, it's yeah. easier to have one sentence, Crowley believed he was the prophet of a new aeon, the end. But I see in that mismatching an answer to a lot of the problems that scholars have faced with Crowley because he is inconsistent and he does speak in different languages. And I think the direction I'm going in, it, it inspires new questions that I think can answer questions that we've been dealing with for decades now. Right. Well, you, you mentioned that he, um, that he did a lot of things that uh, were frowned upon in society. He took drugs. He yep. was, you know, uh, doing a lot of sex magic, although we can't get into the whole concept of sex magic right now. Um, mm-hmm. People on the outside looking in would think, oh, what a, you know, what a terrible, immoral man. And I think we yes. can move now into the into the sphere of uh, popular culture with, uh, with regards to misunderstandings. Um, I mean, Crowley is... is is referred to as, as a Satanist. Uh, oh yeah. He, but it's, as you said, it's, it's almost as if he like invites this type of antagonistic uh, dialogue with people because of the way he talked about himself. I mean, he called yes. himself the great beast 666 yes. and, you know, What did he mean by that? I mean, was he just trying to rile people up and say, yes, I'm the most evil person on the world in the world. I Mm. mean, what, what was it a joke? I mean, what, Mm. what do you think about that? Well, I think it's complicated, like all of, (laughs) like everything about Crowley. Um, But one thing I have to mention, because, you know, there will be listeners here who don't necessarily know a lot about Crowley. He hated black magic he he absolutely did not identify with being a dark magician or you know someone who worshiped devils or or anything in fact he writes about this quite explicitly and he mocks those who would ever be inspired to take such a route he believes that black magicians just destroy themselves not in the way crowley wants to destroy himself but um um they completely lose control. And interestingly enough, um, Crowley believes that the source of this confusion is because they cannot let go of their ego. Um, So black magic for Crowley is this refusal to surrender, this refusal to be absorbed into the divine. And he has a point because in a lot of, you know, black magical, dark magical, left-hand path magical language, there is this resistance to mystical absorption. It is kind of like, no, you're supposed to retain some individuality and it is a weakness to sort of let yourself be completely annihilated for someone else. That's that's more the interpretation 
um, they're going for. And Crowley always insisted that mystical union was, you know, that was it. That was the only way. So in that sense, he's actually extremely conservative. If you compare him to actual black magicians, he would look like, you know, the saintly Catholic mystic who didn't dare, who didn't have the guts to stand up to these cosmic energies and say, I'm going to create my own universe. So that's interesting from the perspective of actual black magicians. He right. looks like, like a good, sweet old guy who actually, yeah, <laughs> Right. Okay, so that's the perspective, though, of other magicians yeah. who were practicing other traditions. But right. I'm talking more about just general, the general public, you know, his, in mm-hmm. his time, and even shortly yeah. after that, and even until this day, people talk yes. about him as a Satanist. Why? Yeah. And, and they talk about all these, you know, horrible things that he did. And, you yeah. know, what. I guess that was my question. What what do you think drove him to antagonize people in such a way, to make people uh-huh. think that, oh, yes, I am the Antichrist. Oh, yes, I am this uh, right. wicked, wicked person. Why mm-hmm. do you think he did that? I think, first of all, he did a lot of weird things just because he thought they were magically powerful and convenient. So okay. there is some truth to some claims, um, you know, but that mostly relates to the sexual magic. Mm-hmm. But I, so that's one aspect. I think he thought that appealing to one's most base instincts and almost doing violence to oneself, um, becoming a caricature, doing stuff you wouldn't ever naturally do. He advises this to his students. This is true. He says, you know, the, the best thing you can do um, in your magical training is to let go of who you are as, as quickly as possible. And he advises different techniques from, you know, cutting yourself systematically to just inventing you're a different person to shake up that hold of the ego. So I think he thinks there is a lot of magical value to shocking yourself. Mm. But that leads me to my cultural, you know, why he did it publicly mm-hmm. I think he saw a parallel between what I just said and what culture, what society needed. He talks Uh. in, I think it is either in his autobiography or in magic, he talks about wanting to shake the Victorian system out of its shackles and shocking people out of their dogmas, out of their superstitions. And if he had to be the villain for it, then fine. You know, that he had no problem, absolutely. And he even invented stuff about himself that, you know, (laughs) scholars may now laugh at as a sign of Crowley's humor, but there are a lot of blogs and websites that absolutely take this seriously, like Crowley sacrificed and ate babies and all of that stuff, (laughs) which Crowley absolutely did to just make people uncomfortable. But he didn't actually sacrifice and eat babies. No. I mean, there's no (laughs) proof, (laughs) but... I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's kind of the tricky, it's a tricky question because I can't really say he didn't do that, but um, he absolutely enjoyed being contrarian, mm. and that's where the beast identification comes from for a for a large part. Well, it also his came mom from his mom, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, you just absolutely. Mentioned his mom would call him the great beast. <laughs> Yes. He grew up in a very Christian family and, uh, you know, he was a very unusual young man. Um, You know, if I can use one word, he he was kind of a pervert and he enjoyed pissing people off, so to speak. And his mom, I mean, I don't know how serious she was, but yeah, she referred to him as the beast from the book of Revelation, Mm -hmm. from the Bible, you know, this big arch enemy of, of Jesus, of God. Um, and Crowley describes in his autobiography that he always felt a certain kinship with this identity, even then as a kid, without really knowing why. I'm guessing it's just because he realized that it was such a contrarian symbol and that he loved how it made people feel. He loved that reaction of both fear and fascination, because, you know, the book of Revelation is a very 
excessive, almost, you know, sexual work that is extremely attractive for people on a certain level of, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating in a certain way as much as, as it is repelling. And I think yes. that matches Crowley's personality mm. so well. But there are a lot more connections. Um, the Beast 666 is also um, Therion. And um, in the Bible, the Beast has a female counterpart, Babylon, or the Scarlet Woman right. who rides it. And both of these are Thelemic deities. Um, Crowley mentions these a couple of times. In fact, he, he pays more attention to Babylon than he does to the Beast 666. Um, so there is absolutely a magical significance as well. And this is, again, typical Crowley. It's come up multiple times during this interview. He uses these symbols and these words on so many different ways. He might use it, you know, to make some Victorian English people uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but he still thinks it has some magical significance nonetheless. And I think in this sense, he uses it for his students because there is this union between this male beast and this female um energy which in the end kind of um is more dominant than this beast is it, it clearly writes sometimes about the beast having to be converted to the new aeon like the beast has to surrender his power to the scarlet woman has to pour his blood into her cup this is a very mm -hmm. common symbol for clearly and it has obvious sexual connotations mm -hmm. as it does mystical connotations right. you know, the mystical death um so i think crowley enjoyed his own brilliance in that sense that he may look like a complete tool and a and a, and a crazy person a dangerous person mm -hmm. while at the same time he knew like hey this this trick that looks like i'm just fooling around actually reveals a very clever a very complete and a very meaningful philosophy so i think he liked playing those discursive games with people mm. yeah very interesting stuff um <laughs> okay so we've been talking about crowley uh in in the sense of you know academics and you know the and the in, in the perception of popular culture in his day and even, even, you know, present day, um, and how paradoxical he is. And it would seem, I guess it would just seem natural that such a figure, such a character would not just, you know, fade away. Someone so controversial and so antagonistic would have, uh, like a lasting effect even after his death. So, uh, you know, one of, one of my goals on this podcast is to include references to popular culture for, you know, contemporary yeah. popular, popular culture that we can see in TV series and films and books and, and, you know, art, music, et cetera, you know, all the different, uh, spheres, uh, so with this, this in mind, let's move into uh, talking a little bit about how uh, Crowley's ideas present themselves to us nowadays. I mean, is it, is it in your opinion, the actual uh, message that Crowley was trying to convey? Or is it now this, um, what would be the word, kind of corrupted sense because mm. a lot of people have misunderstood him and what he's about um mm. that's obvious so when we look to uh media forms what what do we see there number one mm. and is that an accurate representation of him i mean you don't have to mm. list every single one but just you know pick out a few yeah i think he is understood um, I mean, I don't want to say correctly because I understand only, I think I understand only a few portions of his work. I'm trying to understand it as best as I can, but um, there are um, examples of popular culture that I found very surprising in how they seem completely dead on, with, you know, in, in combination with my interpretation. I'm thinking of Promethea, you know, this is a 
graphic novel by Alan Moore. Okay, Alan Moore is a practicing occultist, so there is that connection. (laughs) But the abyss plays a major part in that. So sometimes you do see people genuinely wanting to read Crowley, understanding him as best as they can. There, This year, there was an episode on the Midnight Gospel show on Netflix, which invited, um, I'm not sure if it was a Thelemite magician, but he spoke about Crowley at great length, including this importance of crossing the abyss. So there are these very specific, explicit examples, but there aren't many. And I think it kind of ties back into what I said about scholars Um, not really recognizing this other part about Crowley and focusing more on the prophet and, 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 and the magician, magician, you know, this, this not really a stereotype, but um, he isn't remembered as this lone, sad mystic. That's just not his reputation. So I do think that for better or worse, he had the most impact in, you know, creating these figures of magicians who, um, self-destruct due to their own hubris, um, um, maybe their own perversion, or they're simply using a religious message to hide the fact that they just want to have sex and do drugs. I mean, there was a lot of yeah. B movies from the seventies and eighties I can mention that feature those crazy cult leader figures that are always involved in satanic rituals in human sacrifice and other perversions that I think may have been based on Crowley. Right. Absolutely. Um, but I think if Crowley is genuinely referenced, it is always because that person has a genuine interest in what he was saying. I'm thinking of Led Zeppelin, you know, mm-hmm. there's that connection there, the, even the Beatles, though I'm never quite sure how far that went. But then again, I also think of, um, you know, the famous song, Mr. Crowley, Ozzy Osbourne, where again, it's more about, yeah, this almost um, caricature figure Mm. of a great magician who became a drug addict and a big no one and who was um, interesting, but dangerous. And in a way that fits. um, But, you know, this is obviously popular culture, so I don't expect popular culture to be accurate in that Mm, sense. mm -hmm. But as of later years, I don't see much influence. I, I would really struggle to name examples of popular culture imagery. I think magic in general in popular culture is so difficult to combine with what magicians were doing around Crowley's time. You know, when we think about magic, we think about Harry Potter, we think about these big visual occurrences and and rays from fingers. And, and that's just not what they were doing. Um, Most of those magicians like Crowley were interested in self transformation, but that's not really a big theme that you can present very spectacularly visually so I'm not sure how much impact he had. Um, well, he seems to have I, that. What you, I mean, from from my own, you know, perceptions of of you know watching things, seeing things. I think what you said about this, the the misunderstanding, the caricature of mm-hmm. of Crowley, in that regard, because you know you have series such as uh, Supernatural. Uh, there's yeah. apparently a a, a Crowley type character but he's like the guardian of hell or something to that extent i'm not an expert pardon me all the listeners who love supernatural i'm unfortunately not an expert in that show uh (laughs) but yeah he's he's always associated with demons and you know with the devil and you know just what you said in in music and in references uh to to him uh he's Oftentimes, you know, at least in my, I guess in my collective recollection of, you know, the times that I have heard people uh, or had seen films that reference him, it's always in in reference to or in relation to demons and and the devil. Mm -hmm. And and yet you, you know, you were just saying that he's, you know, he wasn't involved in any of that kind of stuff at all. And He wasn't a Satanist. He didn't worship the devil and he wasn't conjuring demons and he wasn't doing all of that stuff. Well, he he, was, everybody, 
<laughs> well, not in the sense of the of the not yeah. in the sense of what the polemic, you know, the way Christians talk about Satanists yeah. that, you know, yes. the whole narrative of yes, they worship the devil and they sacrifice babies and eat, you know, their cannibals and this, you know, that that whole polemic. Um mm -hmm. So I find that very interesting because what you were talking about earlier about this whole this whole process and this whole struggle of trying to realize your true self and that that is that is all about love. I mean that mm -hmm. is completely separated from all of this other, you know, polemics yeah. about you know he's such a he, he's such a wicked man and he he's a satanist and all that i mean that that goes completely yeah. against everything that he was that he was talking about yeah. really talking about i mean not the he seemed to have many personas that he would uh, yes. you know show to people and yes he was the antagonizer and he did like to rile people up mm -hmm. and he did you know <laughs> He did do all of those things. So it's it's not as if yeah. you can just say equivocally, no, it it is not like that at all. People have got it all wrong because he yeah. did present himself in ways that people could misunderstand. So it's yes. not surprising that people have such strange ideas about what he was really about because he kind of invited that. Yeah. So Plus also he especially in his treatment of other people, has often been accused of just being a really rude, uncaring right. person who may be psychologically abused some people. Mm. Now, that's a lot of conjecture. I don't think it's right to say he didn't do that. You know, it's mm. not my job to paint him as a saint who was just this, this quiet little mystic. He was not. No. But it definitely, that's a completely different subject. Sure, um, yeah saying oh he was just a devil worshiper in a sense it's even less damaging than than really describing his relationships with other people and how they may have been problematic um but yeah i think it's interesting that his what he what what you're talking about what he's really trying to say seems to be not interesting for the public at large and i and i think that ties into popular culture i think his whole insistence on self surrender self destruction as a positive goal this doesn't really match with mm -mm. where we are right now i think a lot of popular culture is extremely individualistic and is in fact completely opposite to what crowley is saying like a, a lot of when we see magic in a lot of shows, it's, you know, I'm thinking, for example, about The Witcher, you know, you have this female mm -hmm. character who becomes immensely powerful. And that is always somehow tied to a, a strengthening of persona, you know, you become more powerful. And that's a good thing. You know, I've never really seen a magician in popular culture who uses magic to destroy themselves and become one with the universe and suddenly can't speak anymore because they d can't use language. It's not a great template no. for a show. <laughs> no. So that's interesting in and of itself that magic as practiced by Crowley is, it's just not very attractive to a lot of people. You know, who wants to spend years of their lives trying to undo everything about their personality to the point where they can't even recognize themselves in the mirror? Yeah, and sounds like fun. I, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so I think there's different evaluations of what magic is supposed to do. And I think that's why Crowley is still so interesting because he is so different than what you'd expect. You don't expect mm. a magician to care about the stuff he cares about. Mm. So, so is I this, think, sorry, go ahead. No, I, uh, I just wanted to say, I think maybe in the future, because we're seeing a lot more complex characters, and even in The Witch, which I just mentioned, mm -hmm. this female character is ultimately unsatisfied with her magical powers. They're not giving her what she wants. And that's when I sat up and thought, this is something Crowley could relate to. Yeah. You know, I have all the magical power that I could wish but it's not enough somehow. So I think maybe in the future, since we're seeing more delicate, complex characters, maybe 
it can be more of a match in the future. I don't know. Mm. I'm, I think magic has already become a lot more interesting in popular culture than mm. it was, say, in the 80s. Absolutely. Mm. So do you think Thelema is still relevant for people today? It's still a massive movement. Mm. Um, it has succeeded incredibly well to develop itself online. Although that is, I mean, I can say that about um, so many occult movements like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn still exists. Okay, tons of debate about whether or not they really relate to the to the real one, mm-hmm. so to speak. But these online communities are incredibly intense and huge. So I think even though it may not always be so public, a lot of people are still very attracted to these specific types of practice, types of philosophies. These organizations still exist. You know, like I said before, the AA still exists. Apparently, I I see these little references sometimes to people who, who, you know, often very vaguely um, suggest that you can come into contact with people who are part of this organization. There's the OTO, um, you know, of which clearly was, he basically changed that whole organization. Mm -hmm. Still huge, especially in the United States. And you have completely different traditions like the Dragon Rouge in Sweden, also a very large magical community. So this idea that this is sort of dying out, Mm. I wouldn't say that at all. I think these groups show immense intelligence in adapting their message to an online platform. Um, I'm even seeing um, online... um, courses in magic online um astral initiations by proxy um you know people still care i think there's still Mm. a tremendous romantic longing for that idea of a mystical society where people come together and 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 just talk about these subjects and and progress together and interestingly enough i think again curly's model of shut up and do your work, which sometimes he just says so explicitly, again, not very attractive. So even though Thelema is very big, I think if we would look at the numbers of people who just talk about it online versus the people who actually practice what he's doing, it would be a massive difference in scale. You have a lot of occultist writers, like, for example, Robert Anton Wilson or Christopher Hyatt, um, you know, who were really big in this second half of the 20th century, who say, we meet Crowley fans all the time, who know all about Crowley, have read everything about him, and they haven't done one single experiment, one single practice. So there is this resistance, I think, still to actually getting your hands dirty in the way he did. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. So that's interesting still that... um, this idea of a mystical fraternity is still maybe more powerful than just, you know, shutting up and doing the work, like Crowley said. (laughs) Um, So that'll be interesting to see how that develops into the future. Indeed, it will. Indeed, it will. Okay, now I'm going to, I've saved the best for last. My uh, my last questions are going to be about you. Oh, God. Yes. (laughs) Uh, So why... Does Crowley appeal to you so much? Um, I think he is, uh, well, I can answer as an academic and I can answer as like a non-academic, but I'll answer as an academic first. (laughs) He exemplifies a trend in occultism that I find very fascinating. And and I wrote my research master thesis based on the observation that Crowley isn't alone in um, seeming self-aware about playing discursive games. Um, It's such a standard observation for scholars of our field to make that all of the figures we study seem to have a certain conflict in communicating their spiritual experiences through language. They all seem to sort of accept or at least acknowledge that rational language just is not built to communicate spiritual truths, but yet they still write and they still communicate. And um, 
I think scholars have often maybe, and myself included probably, seen that as kind of a weakness in the sense of, you know, if you can't communicate rationally, then why do you? You know, it's just self-defeating. Um, and it's easy for, as a scholar, to sort of pat yourself on the back and say, oh, I'm so clever that I thought of that. But I think it's a little naive to assume that esotericists don't realize this themselves. Mm. And what I see in, in Crowley and in my research master's thesis, I focused on Diane Fortune and Israel Regardi, all figures around the same time, they seem incredibly self-aware of the fact that they have to speak a false language in order to get their point across to such a degree that they even sometimes seem to admit it explicitly um, in a very pragmatic way. Um, and in my research master's thesis, I have this a bunch of quotations that exemplify this. Um, going as far as Crowley saying, you know, all symbols are fundamentally false. And he doesn't explicitly say, so mine are too, but that's the only logical conclusion you can make. <laughs> They're all just tools to free yourself. And, and when you have done so, then you will realize that it was only just a game, so to speak. Mm. It was never really about the gods or about planes of existence or about the four elements. This is just a temporary terminology you need. Um, and the less time you focus on trying to understand them rationally, the better, because they're not made to be understood that way. And I am fascinated by that self-awareness. Um, and I think it's so important as a scholar to remember that because they're not writing for us. They do not wish to be under, I mean, they don't care if we understand them. Crowley himself has written so violently against academic culture and against the idea of teaching at all. Um, he he would probably laugh at me for trying to understand him at all because he would think, well, you're almost getting the point, but you are you will never understand me unless you do these practices. That's number one. You can't skip that step. And this level of explicitness, I think, is unique. You can study a Renaissance magician and try to figure out how they understood themselves in that way. You know, what is my role as a speaker? How do I write what I write? And I think with starting with Crowley, uh, occultists become a lot more explicit about this problem. You know, how are we going to deal creatively with the fact that we can't communicate anything that we wish to communicate? So this idea of playing discursive games comes up. Um, and Crowley just seems to drop such a massive breadcrumb trail. He's not even trying to hide it, which I think is fascinating. He is saying over and over so many times, don't believe me. Whatever you do, do <laughs> not believe me. Shut up. My only job is to make you shut up and just do your work. Work with these symbols and, and drop them as soon as you can because they're just tools to help you but they're not means to i mean they're they're not the result the result is always going to be taking place in this non-dualistic state and it creates such a problem for academics because how do you then study anything how can you know if you're getting crowley or not right. and how can we solve that without becoming a magician ourselves and i like those questions mm. i think they're um, very stimulating. And I think it's such a massive opportunity to um, now be able to start a dialogue with contemporary um, followers of Crowley and, and study, okay, so how do you deal with this? How do you deal with the fact that Crowley is saying, don't believe me, do, do you, do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, have these experiences. These are the things that matter. And it creates such an opportunity to, 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 shine more light on these experiences and like how can you dissociate so badly from yourself that you don't even identify as yourself anymore but you're still able to lead a normal life how does that work how do these how do these experiences work how do you achieve them 
how do you cultivate them? I think these are all questions that can only arise in a modern context because mm-hmm. we can actually see the experiments. We can talk to people who are performing these exercises. And I'm fascinated by that possibility. And I worry sometimes that a lot of academic research is still too historical, trying to trace ideas, which I agree is immensely important, but we have such an opportunity to enter into a dialogue with people who are performing similar stuff. Right. And we can allow that to enrich our understanding of Crowley, for example. Mm. So I think it, it just creates a massive incentive for a different kind of research so that would be my academic answer. Okay. Um, Which is a very good answer. answer. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, personally, I am kind of like Crowley, I guess. I guess it's time for a big reveal. Um, da, da, da. I, <laughs> <laughs> I sympathize with Crowley's search for truth and his, and he has this beautiful, um, poem in which he writes that um, somehow you never really find all the answers in in religion. Somehow you never really find all the answers in science. Um, It's like you're looking for truth, but you're too critical. You're too smart to accept any, anything that someone throws your way. You have such a powerful mind that you're sadly able to shoot down any solution anyone gives you so you're self-sabotaging constantly and it makes it so much more difficult to find anything that survives your intellect so to speak um and i'm fascinated by this idea that crowley managed to solve this by destroying his own mind i think that's just such an angle you don't expect, like, oh, my mind is actually the the cure, but also eventually the problem. Like, I've managed to um, come up with all of these techniques, and I've managed to create a system that works, but ultimately it is designed to annihilate all of my talents, which are intellectual. And it's so obvious from Crowley's writing that he takes such pride in his intellect and in his smarts and yet that is the thing that we we most importantly have to surrender and i'm fascinated by that it's such a sad twist to the tail um and yet the creative way in which crowley deals with that and the humor and and i think he would have been a fantastic teacher um and he's just, he's just one of a kind, you know, I am just so disappointed. I can't invite him over for English tea and just <laughs> say, just what were you trying to say? Because I can tell that there's something so, that he found something really special. Even if it's just a state of mind we can induce in a lab somewhere, um, I think his experiments have been incredibly interesting and and pioneering. And I think I want to spend more time looking at that from any angle I can, whether that's academically or personally. I'm very interested in um, these non-dualist states and how they how they relate to creativity and to um, meaningfulness and identity. And those are all subjects I care about deeply. And I'm, interested in his marriage of everything religious scientific magical mystical um intellectual artistic um he is just offers so much uh and i will spend a lifetime trying to understand his works i know that already i I won't be able to read everything he wrote and i find that incredible so I will never stop being a fan of his because he just gives you so much to think about. And um, it's just a great personal inspiration. Well, wow. That yeah. is uh, incredibly thought provoking. I think, I think we're going to really? leave it there. Great. Thank you for being here today with me. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really, really an honor. And good luck with this amazing project. 
Many thanks again to Thomas for agreeing to do this interview. You might have noticed that he mentioned his research master thesis. Unfortunately, I can't link this in the podcast notes on the website as it is now undergoing a major rewrite. However, Thomas is working on an article that deals largely with with the things we discussed in this interview. So I will be sure to keep you all informed when it and the thesis are finished. Uh, Please visit the website for more information about the works mentioned here and other references should you be interested to know more. And please leave some feedback. I'm very interested to know what you think. Thanks for listening.